on the count of 5 4 3 2 1 hello and welcome to success series with ravi a podcast channel on youtube where we talk to successful people from all around the world and learn from them success secrets today i'm thrilled to have with me robbie crapery who is the founder of performative speaking in short robbie helps people become great speakers he has been a trial lawyer teacher and a storyteller but we'll learn more about that from him now i bumped onto robbie on twitter um, a few weeks ago and i was amazed to see his growing fan following and the kind of, of feedback that his that some of his students give about him but before we uh, ask him the first question here's a request to all of you viewers it takes a lot of hard work to run a podcast channel and the only thing that keeps uh, us going is uh, and getting inspiring guests is when we have subscribers so hit that subscribe button now and uh, thank you with that and let's welcome our guest today hello ravi welcome to success series with ravi how are you doing today i'm doing great how are you ravi i'm doing great as well very thrilled to have this conversation as i said i bumped on to you at least a month ago and then uh, we chatted uh, um once in a while on on twitter dms but i always um, so i have this podcast over 2 uh, years now and i and i speak to anybody that i find inspiring and uh, catch them and get them on to my podcast and uh, i i wanted because i saw you as somebody who is really passionate about what uh, you are doing and you are and you're great at what you're doing there is so much of uh, um validation that i hear from from your audience and then you come across as somebody very authentic and the way you have built uh, that authentic self on twitter is also quite inspiring and then now your avatar on youtube is also quite engaging so i wanted to get you on, on on this conversation and learn about your journey and how it has been so before we get into the meteor things uh, why don't you share a bit about your own career trajectory sure thing so i like to say at this point of my career i help people become great speakers that's my goal to help them become great public speakers and i want to take you back to a trial that i had as a lawyer that really demonstrates why <clears throat> i believe in this power so much and so i was a trial lawyer in the child abuse division in dallas it is a very difficult unit to be in so it's called the crimes against children unit the cases as you can imagine are very emotional very tough to deal with It's an elite unit inside of that district attorney's office because it takes a special person and takes a ton of work and time and you have to do a lot of extra learning in order to be prepared to try those cases. But I was in this trial. And I'll never forget it because we were going into this case. It was extremely serious. It was one of the worst cases I'd ever heard of. <clears throat> But the victim of the crime didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to come forward. didn't want to have to face these demons that the victim had really buried. And I remember going through the case and realizing it was just so horrific that there was no way that I could let that go. There's no way I could let the person who did this get away with it and potentially do it to somebody else. And so I ended up working with this victim for about 6 weeks and we were meeting regularly building his confidence <laughs> building his ability to tell his story just working through all these issues and we went through this trial and at the end of it it was just absolutely brutal and i remember watching my jury as i got up for closing argument and they were just wrecked just really really wrecked and in that moment though i got up and the way i started my my closing argument was actually with a quote and the quote is joy cometh in the morning which seems really strange and bizarre but it was extremely effective because what i followed that up with is this idea of today was a day for joy to finally come out for the jury because they could do the right thing and feel empowered in what they had the opportunity to do to protect children and to put somebody really evil away so that they couldn't hurt anybody else and also for the victim of this crime 
who Joy could finally come today because he no longer had to worry. He didn't have to worry about the, the defendant hurting his sister, hurting himself, any of those sort of factors. <clears throat> and I remember giving that closing argument and in, in it, every juror ended up crying, every single juror, because the story was so powerful. But what really stood out to me and why I am so passionate about this idea of public speaking and using it to really help not only our life, but other people's lives, is at the end of that trial, when the defendant was found guilty and ultimately sentenced to the rest of his life in prison for what he had done, the jury asked, can we come out and go give the victim and his family a hug and just love on them. And they did. Every one of them walked out of the jury room, walked through those doors, and just surrounded this family in love. And it was that moment where I'm watching this and watching the family break down in tears, watching the jurors break down in tears, that it really hit home. This ability for words and being a good public speaker and using these tools to help others be able to tell their story, but also myself use them in a really effective way to get results, could change lives, could bring about actual change. And you were talking about this idea of me being the founder of performative speaking. The interesting thing is the word performativity actually means the ability for words to bring about change. And that is part of why I named it performative speaking. So my background is as a trial lawyer. I tried 102 jury trials over my career. That's how I got to the point I am. I also coach the national mock trial team at the SMU Law School here in Dallas. I teach persuasive speaking there. And now I run this performative speaking course and brand around my philosophy when it comes to speaking. And that's really where my career has taken me. Thank you. So usually, I ask this question to all my guests and um, everybody, all the guests, most of them are passionate about something and uh, that would be a result of multiple influences in their lives, right? So how do you say what were your life influences in different stages of your life that has shaped you to become what you are today? They could be books, people and cultures across your life. Maybe you could shed some light there. I mean, I think the earliest influence on me was just my father. And I don't think that one is unique to a lot of people, but watching my dad go from a position where he was told it was a temporary job and that he was going to lose it to ultimately turning it into a vice president role and building a massive position inside of his company over time and watching him and the way he dealt with people, the way he talked to them, the way he led conversations, the way he led people, that all really influenced me early on. As I got older though, obviously, you start to be exposed to other ideas. So some of that would just be my experience as a college baseball player. That really formed a lot of who I am and taught me a great deal about playing on a team, but also having personal responsibility. So that had a very large influence in my life. In terms of books and things of that nature, I'd really point to a couple. So one would be Gates of Fire. It's a book by Stephen Pressfield. It's what the movie 300 is actually based off of. And to me, that's my favorite book. I read it on a regular basis. I have a signed first, first edition by Stephen Pressfield because it's so meaningful to me. Also, the four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss had a huge influence on my life where I didn't want to just be working in a job and punching the clock and going day after day after day and not feeling like I was actually serving a greater purpose. So that pushed me to begin my career as a prosecutor working on these types of cases and has ultimately led me to pursuing now performative speaking, what I'm doing in this world. Some of the other stuff though, that's really framed me as, or influenced me as I think back on it are like early books I read. So there's a series called the Redwall series and the author was Brian Jocks. He has since passed away, but they're about like mice and badgers and fighting these wars. So it's kind of a takeoff of Watership Down. And I remember those were the first books that really influenced me in terms of storytelling and how powerful that tool could be, because I love those. That's what created my love of reading. That's what created my love of stories. Right. And if you know anything about me now, I love stories. I continue to tell them. They're a huge influence in my life. And then the last part I'll say, and I'll then we can move on, is I had a couple of great mentors when I was at the Dallas District Attorney's Office who really showed me how to be a great trial lawyer, showed me how to be a great public speaker, showed me how to relate to people, 
how to have a real sense of an ethical duty, but still be extremely effective as a trial lawyer. And those people will always stand out to me. I'll always remember them. They were super high up in the office. They really had no business being a mentor to me, given their position, my position when I started out. But it had a huge effect on me and really accelerated my growth as a trial lawyer and got me to where I was able to try these really big time cases like the capital murders, murders, child abuse cases early in my career. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Pissfield, uh, Gates of Fire and Never Read. I, I know only of War of Art. That was one of my favorite books. Um, but thanks for also talking about Gates of Fire. I'll, I'll check that out. Uh, thank you for sharing all your influences and uh, quite, quite um, varied and uh, diverse. And that uh, clearly shows in your personality and character today. Um, so you also mentioned how public speaking became your uh, passion. Um, at what point did you feel that uh, this needs to be taken to the next stage and not just be your own strength, but should be shared uh, as a service to the world? W what was that one one point of time that you felt like that? So in terms of one point, it's hard to pick one point. I think it was a progression. Right. I think I always had this idea that this was a strength that I had from about high school on. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a trial lawyer is I knew that that would create a skill set that was unique, that I could end up using outside of just the legal world. Now, I didn't know exactly what that was going to look like, but I knew there was something there. I would say realistically, it was five years into my time as a trial lawyer where I realized I had enough experience and enough skills because I was being asked to train a lot of the lawyers who were coming into our office. Right. And a lot of lawyers were coming to me to run ideas by me, prepare for speeches, prepare for closings, were watching me. That's when I realized something I'm doing is really resonating with people. Right. At that point, SMU, the law school, had been asking me to come back and, and coach and teach at the school. And originally they had asked me that right when I graduated, given my background on the national mock trial team during law school. But I'd said no, because I didn't have any experience. I don't want to be one of those people who thinks just because I've graduated from law school, now I can teach other, other law students. Yeah. I wanted real life experience, real results that I could point to and say, I've done this. This is why you should believe me. I've tested it. I've seen it. I've done it. And so about five years in, I realized I had hit enough trials, enough big trials to say, I can come back and teach now. And I think that was the moment that I started seeing, hey, this teaching thing is really enjoyable and I'm pretty good at it. Like right away, that was one of those things. I was pretty good at that, that task. Right. I was able to translate what I knew to other students and see success. And so essentially what I did is I spent that first year teaching, saw good results, said, okay, that's cool, but I want to make sure I can validate it in a second year. So the second year I did it again. And that year, all my students swept all the awards at the SMU Law School. Wow. That's when I realized, all right, I'm really onto something here. Mm. And that's ultimately where we get to now I'm in year three of teaching and coaching the national mock trial team at SMU and realize, hey, there's a market for all this stuff that's broader than just these law students. Right. And I, was working, I was working with some clients just coaching and on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but wasn't putting it out to the public in this yeah. more you know, public facing entity. And that's where I said, look, it's time to go bigger. It's time to really push this out and help people become the speaker that they want to be. Because not only does it make you better for that skill, but it actually just improves the entirety of your life. Got it. Got it. And what kind of people do you attract? Like, um, I always felt that only lawyers need to be good speakers or say CEOs need to be good speakers. Do you think uh, public speaking is a skill that is that is a baseline skill for everybody? 100%. Everybody needs to, to have it. Every conversation we have is public speaking. Every time we give a pitch, it's public speaking. Every time we go into a meeting, and are talking to other people, it's a public speaking opportunity. Public speaking will give you better relationships. It is also part of being a better listener, being able to ask better questions. It'll make your relationships better in life. You'll be more interesting at networking events, at parties, at friends and family get togethers. And you'll have greater career potential 
no matter what your career is, because if you can communicate effectively, you have a leg up on other people, whether that's in the tech industry, as a salesperson, as some sort of middle manager, as an accountant, as a, you know, lawyer, obviously, as a CEO, as a investor, as a venture capitalist, like the list is endless for how much better your life will be if you have this baseline skill. Got it. So tell us, tell us more about performative speaking. What exactly do you teach? What's the format like? Uh, what's the duration like? That would be great to know. Performative speaking is the philosophy that I kind of created during my, my time in law school and as a trial lawyer. And what that really looks at is people are moved by emotions. They're not moved by logic. They're not moved by reason. They use those things to explain why they made a decision, but it's the emotions that actually drive them. So that's kind of point number one to always be aware of. The biggest thing that I was seeing as a trial lawyer is most people were speaking just to logic and reason and thinking that would convince people. And it won't. You have to be speaking to emotion. But then what we've got to figure out is how do we create that emotion and create the right emotion in our audience? Because just because I'm excited doesn't mean you're going to be excited, Ravi. And I might be sick on a day. I don't want you to get the energy of me being sick. I want you to get the energy of whatever the goal is for you to feel. So we have to start thinking about how can we achieve that? And really what I found was successful is looking at these external sources of inspiration. And that's, that's where I get into these ideas of movies and television and pop culture and travel experiences to find these sources of inspiration where I can say, you know what? I have felt this emotion at some point in my life that I want my jury to feel, that I want my audience to feel, that I want the investors to feel. Once I know what that source is, let's say it's a scene from The Dark Knight, okay? Now I can take that scene and analyze it and say, why were they so successful in making me feel this way? If I do that, then I can reverse engineer from my goal of convincing a pitch that they should invest in my company. I can all of a sudden reverse engineer and say, I need to create this emotion Here's when I felt it. Let's bridge that gap and figure out how can I use the tools at my disposal as a speaker. So when it comes to pacing, rhythm, tone, volume, structure, storytelling, all of these techniques and skills we have and use it to recreate that emotion for my audience so that they'll feel the same way I did when I watched that scene. And ultimately, they'll do what I want them to do. Got it. So, uh, and what's the duration like? And how, if, if somebody uh, enrolls for this course, uh, how long does it take? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's a process, right? So public speaking is something that you need to practice for years before you become, if you have a semblance of getting better. Uh, so how do you uh, bring that together in this short time frame? Sure. So with performance speaking as a philosophy, I then created this course, right? That kind of teaches it. And that course is five weeks long. And the reason is we spend four weeks really doing a lot of teaching and practicing in every session. And we have three sessions a week. There's two breakout rooms. So you're actually practicing the things we're talking about. And we really spend the first about week and a half going over the strategy of a speaker. The next week and a half going over the tactics of a speaker. And the last week kind of putting them together. And then the final week, what we do is do live speeches in front of the entire class. And that is this really cool moment where everybody gets up and delivers a three to five minute talk. And the prompt for this year, for this cohort was, what's your perfect intro? And how does that reflect where you're going in 2021? And it was incredibly powerful because they had all these tools because during those four weeks, not only are they getting practice in those breakout rooms, we have a thing called CrossFit for speaking every Saturday where they actually go from a completely blank page to creating a speech in 90 minutes using a framework that I give them. And then they are also each week creating a video using a prompt that I give them. And they're different. One will be more of an informative pitch. One will be a actual like selling yourself or selling an idea. Another one will be interview people. So you get those interviewing skills. And another one is a go-to story. So they create these videos, they get feedback from the community, feedback from me, and they create a final version and then publish them. So they're getting practice multiple ways, which ultimately leads to, in this last cohort we ran, 
we saw a 44% average increase in speaking ability from the beginning of the course until the end of those five weeks. Nice. Awesome. Um, excellent. Thank you. So they say uh, you need to practice and practice uh, till you find your voice. I've heard this uh, phrase. Uh, but what could you explain me? What does finding your own voice mean? Because we all have our voice. What's the point of finding our own voice? I love this question because I think it's it really goes to who we are as a speaker and our authenticity. And in fact, the YouTube video I released yesterday talks about this exact idea. And it actually is using the reference from the television show Parks and Rec. And there's an episode where they're trying to figure out what the character's dog is. <clears throat> it's the way I like to think about it is to do this. Again, use external sources. So find speakers that you resonate with, whether they're characters in television or movies or real life characters. Who do you like? Who resonates with you? And then how can you incorporate that into your own voice? Now, here's the thing. You can have different voices. They just, like, I don't always present the same way, right? I present differently when I'm speaking with my friends and family than I do in front of a jury. Those are different voices, and I like to call them different characters of myself. But just like a great actor can play multiple characters, think of Daniel Day-Lewis. That man can play basically any character, and it comes across as authentic. Matthew McConaughey is another great example. He has this identity in the real world is kind of like this all right all right all right type guy but then he can play something as serious as dallas dallas buyers club or true detective and you don't feel like it's inauthentic you feel like it is he is being an authentic person in that role so you can have different characters it's just about finding your voice in terms of how you want to present yourself are you loud and over the top are you quiet and more intimate are you speaking faster and trying to, you know, to excite your crowd? Like there's different ways, but I think using external sources to say, I really like how these people speak and I want to take more of their skills and incorporate mm. them. And in fact, that's what I did as a trial lawyer. I would watch when I was younger, great trial lawyers, and I would just take from them. If I saw something I liked, I'd take it and turn it into my, my own version and take from another one and turn it into my own version. Over time, what you get is like this melting pot where you've mixed all these pieces together and that's how you create your authentic voice because you've taken all these pieces you like right. and figured it out. But here's the thing, your authentic voice is going to evolve over time. Mm. It's not a stagnant thing. You just have to really start taking an awareness of how do I want to sound? What is my approach? What is this character? And then building out the best version of that. So when you present as a speaker, you're able to sell people. Got it. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, do, do you remember when you began to find your uh, voice? Was it uh, during your uh, uh, lawyer days? So, I mean, I always had an idea <clears throat> of my voice, but I think I had pieces of it were wrong early on. I was always from high school on. I was a pretty good speaker. I understood how to be motivational. I understood how to do those sort of things. But the biggest mistake I made was thinking that loud meant powerful. <clears throat> And that wasn't really how I, how I worked best. So for whatever reason, when I get loud, it actually comes across as very aggressive. Right. And early on in my career, I would get loud thinking that it would show power and really move people. And it was having the opposite effect. People were basically kind of recoiling and going defensive on it because it just came across as aggressive. So I had to develop that portion of my voice and actually figure out I much more prefer going really soft, going very slow and going very intimate for big moments rather than going super loud. Right. And that took some time. And I remember one of the movies that actually helped me understand that was 300. Mm -hmm. And that movie you actually watched, yes, there's some really loud, big moments. Right. But most of the time they're talking, it's very quiet, very slow. And it actually builds up to those big moments. So that's why when you hear Leonidas say something like, this is Sparta, it's really powerful because he's just been doing this very slow, very quiet, more intimate speech. And I really learned a lot from that about how I can use volume when I go loud in a very, very short burst coming off of this slower and more quiet to be more authentic to who I am. And that was just a trial and error type thing. Got it. 
many speakers who are professional speakers and have great charisma on stage when they are facing the audience and they can uh, enthrall the audience and inspire the audience especially after covid struggled to make the same impression on front of camera um what what do you think are the differences between speaking in front of uh, public live on stage and on camera can you can you replicate the same magic what what are the trade offs between them can you replicate it no it's never going to be as powerful on a screen as it is in real life that's just there's just something different about being in person and the energy that you're feeling between the people right now that doesn't mean you still can't do a very good job on camera this is not an excuse to say oh it's on zoom or it's on camera so i'm not going to put in the the time and the energy and the effort right so what can you do well, in person, you obviously get to use your whole body, your language, your body language plays a huge role. The energy and the vibes you get to give off are, are really powerful. And you have an easier time reading your audience because you right. can look out at them while you're talking and get immediate feedback. So even if you have a slide, the slide is up on a screen somewhere else behind you. <clears throat> on Zoom, if you have a slide up or something, you get to see a few boxes. Right. Now, you can still read your audience, but it's tougher because one of the things I love to do in person is like, I will drill down with my eye contact on one person mm. and make it so uncomfortable for them and for everybody else. It actually attracts all this attention to me because people will sit there and say, why is he looking at this person so intently? Mm -hmm. so most people play this game with eye contact where they go broad instead of deep. I like going super deep because my goal is to convince one person, 100% that whatever I'm saying is right. And the Lovely. easy way to do that is to build that really deep connection into that person. And right. once I know I have them, then I move on. Right. So I can't do that on Zoom because you don't actually get to tell if I'm looking at you in the eyes or anything like that. So that's one problem. Right. However, you can kind of see, even when I'm talking on screen here, I'm fairly animated, fairly open using using facial expressions, using right. movement, using my hands. Right. You can still do all of this right. to demonstrate this warmth, this presence, this excitement, this energy, to still deliver a really impactful speech through Zoom, through a computer, whatever it may be. Mm. It is harder and it is not as effective, but that is not an excuse to say, well, I'm not gonna try because you can still do great things over this medium. Lovely, thank you, thank you so much. Yes, you are animated and you are energetic, and it comes comes through, and it actually comes through to the other person, and it rubs off some of that energy. Uh, you can't help it. You you mentioned about uh, you um, um, uh, catering to the emotions more than logic and uh, reasoning, right? Uh, how do you do that? How can one cater to emotion uh, more than logic and uh, reason? So logic and reason is when we're just talking facts and figures and stats, and we think that that's going to somehow sell people because we say, well, this plus this equals this, and that's why you should do it. But that's not really what happens. So when we're talking emotions, we want to use emotional language, things that trigger us to say, oh, that's exciting, or I'm interested in that. Tell me more. Or that's very sad. Like, that's hard to listen to. Right. We want to do, do things of that nature. So, I mean, if you're just talking about numbers, like, it's, it's never going to be emotional, but you can use emotional language to, to create a, a sense of desire for your audience to actually take action. So what I like to think of this is you want to use words that really call to the senses. So you want them to see it, feel it, hear it, experience it, smell it, taste it, all those sort of things. Play to your senses. That's your emotional language. And the other way, too, we're playing with emotions is the way we deliver. So pacing, structure, right. like structure is a huge thing. If you can structure a speech or a talk right, you can do really cool things with the emotion because you okay. can basically set things up where I like to call it like a stacking principle. You can basically set up your big reveal at the end by doing things early on. So emotionally, they're prepared to go with you once you get to that point. That's one way of doing it. Pacing and and volume and like your tone and your rhythm and all these things you want your speaking. If you're trying to hit the emotions to, in a lot of ways, feel like music, music moves our moves us emotionally. 
Right. And if you can create something that feels like music, that sounds like music, that feels like the words are in color instead of black and white, that's right. how you start getting people to feel emotion. So those are some of the, the interesting ways to do that. It's This is why I say it's hard on the abstract to figure out how to do that. It's a lot easier when you can say, I remember this scene mm. and why I felt the way that I did. It was because this music was playing in this specific way and the lighting was done in this way and the costumes were this way and it was set up by this earlier scene and we can recreate that when we're delivering it. Right. That's why I like external sources. Mm -hmm. but again, language is going to play a big part. So for instance, I, I like this example a lot. If I were to be telling you something and I said, it was nighttime as he walked. Mm -hmm. I told you, and that's like a, a logical explanation that it was nighttime as he walked, right? But right. let's let's actually make it emotional. Mm. He looked up and saw the bright moon that night mm. as it made his way along the sidewalk. Lovely. And as <laughs> he also saw that big black sky, he saw a thousand twinkling stars to Lovely. guide him along this path. So it's visual imagery. Yep. Nice. It's, you're saying the same thing, right? Both of those are saying it's night, but you're right. saying it in two different ways. One is a very logical approach of just saying, hey, it was nighttime and we're going to move on. Another is actually fleshing that out and making you see it. When you hear the moon is shining down on the sidewalk right. and the black sky with a thousand twinkling st stars, right. you immediately in your head think, oh, I know what that looks like versus night. What does that mean? Okay, it's night and you move on. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. These are all pearls of wisdom. Um, one challenge I have faced, uh, even though I have done interviews uh, more than 100 episodes now, one challenge I have faced is I still use a lot of ums and ahs and the filler words, and that kills the impact of your delivery or a sentence. Uh, it's called, I, I did some research about it. It's called verbal float sam, so which is while you're thinking or taking a break, you just fill it up with mm, ahs, and you don't have that. Um, the best speakers don't have that. What are the ways one can get rid of that habit? Okay, so first off, the biggest thing to remember is slow down when you're speaking. That removes a lot of them. The reason being a lot of ums and uhs and filler words come in because we're speaking too quickly and we get to a point where our brain's trying to catch up with what we just said, which mm. then puts us in this moment of, I don't know what to say next. And your options are filler word or silence. Most people are so terrified of silence that they fill it with filler words. Right. Silences would be much better, isn't it? It would create more impact. <laughs> much better. So silence, when you do that, demonstrates a couple things. One, it demonstrates confidence as a speaker that you're mm -hmm. confident enough in yourself to take that pause, to think about what you're gonna say next and then deliver it. Second, nice. it demonstrates a level of vulnerability. It shows that you are exposing yourself to the audience and giving them trust to stay with you and understand that you're human and that sometimes you need a pause to figure out your next thought. Lovely. And, and third, it shows a level of thoughtfulness. It mm -hmm. shows that you're actually thinking through what you wanna say which again, adds value to your message because as humans, we want to feel like the person speaking to us is thinking about their answers. They're not just regurgitating some garbage. We want it to feel organic and like they actually were responding to what we were saying or asking. So those things are really powerful. That's where I would start. If you're actually needing a way to break the habit, so I, will, I have this, it's just a little clicker. And I do that to students and clients that I train. When they start saying these filler words, I will just click it. And it's a little bit like Pavlov's dogs type oh. situation where after about a week of doing it, they will start hearing themselves do it. And you actually see them like cringe getting right. ready for the, the sound because it's very annoying. Right. And all of a sudden, after they get to that point, they'll start, you'll see their mouth. You'll see their mouth going to a filler word. Right. And they actually stop hmm. and just sit in silence because they realize if they say what's going to come out of their mouth next, they're getting a click and they know how painful that is. And right. I've done this with students on my mock trial team a lot. And it right. is incredibly effective. 
it is incredibly annoying, but incredibly effective. Got it. Got it. Yeah, pa Pavlov's dog experiment is good. However, the the point is the lack of discipline and the awareness. Okay, um, when I am aware, like I am talking to a confident speaker now, so automatically some of your energy is rubbing onto me. I want to match up to you, so I might not demonstrate the same weaknesses. The moment I go to an uh, just about any other speaker, that awareness goes away. And as a result, so if I'm aware, I perform well. If I'm not aware, <laughs> I go back to the old habits. So that's you the know, what one thing is: the more you do it, though, the more you're aware of it, the easier it becomes in day-to-day -day conversation. And the truth is, there is a time for those filler words to come in. If you're in a more friendly conversation with friends or family, and you're speaking a little bit faster, that's okay to throw some of those in. But when you are trying to speak more clearly, more confidently, more powerfully, that's when you want to be aware and really cut those things out. Got it. Thank you. These 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 are these are great inputs. Um, let's uh, let's switch gears a bit, and I would want to know about this um, wonderful, fascinating um, medium, social media medium called Twitter, and I have. I am also a newbie in Twitter, uh, but then I, I, I was exposed to such wonderful uh, people and this entire community and these groups, people helping each other, promoting each other, and this was this was such a welcome uh, site for me uh, comparing to uh, say uh, Facebook or Instagram, which does not demonstrate such uh, brotherhood, <laughs> so to say, very positive energy, and I mean I, I just love it. It's very positive. Um, so tell us about your stint with t Twitter. How did you embrace Twitter and how did you become good at it? Because I have a few follow-up questions to that because I, I read your last post where you made friends with Jack Butcher. So you were able to meet with amazing people. So just tell us your journey. How did you get started and how is it evolving now? So realistically, back in June, I decided to start taking Twitter seriously. I'd been on Twitter for maybe eight, nine years at that point, and it just really messed around, had no clue what I was doing. In June, I was at 180 followers, and I stumbled upon David Perel and Matthew Kobach's talk on Zoom during COVID about how to crush it on Twitter. I see. And they, they essentially laid out the game plan. Pick a niche, pick three topics you want to talk about, tweet regularly, provide value, do all the right things, and just stay consistent. That's what I did. And so for the next, now I think we're in month six, I have just been consistent talking about public speaking, trial lawyer, pop culture. And as I've grown, I add in some like Twitter growth and branding and kind of how to use Twitter best type, type material. Got it. That was really the key is just talking about those things, providing value and trying to be helpful. Anybody who wanted to, I would connect with. Any person who wanted to talk, I would talk to. Right. And you just build real connections. And I think that's actually the strength of Twitter is the people you meet, the network you build. Yes. I don't think Twitter is a great platform. Like, I don't care about how many followers are really there. I care about the connections that I'm making. Mm, that's important. And that really leads to, I mean, I have a group of probably, I would say 50 people I've met on Twitter who are truly a game changing network to have in my life. And awesome. that, that includes people like Jack Butcher. And I put that, that tweet out about becoming friends and that was, sorry, I have it here. So he actually had sent me this, this book, his visualized value book that mm -hmm. he, that he created. Right. So let's see, you can see it just has some of his like his designs. Lovely. Yeah. I'm a big fan of his. And he sent that to me. I mean, we've become friends. Like I've been on his office hours. We chat regularly. And it was just because we, we started talking. Like I took his courses. I gave him feedback. We would talk about the ideas I was building. I would try to provide value to him and his community. And over time, it just kind of led to this connection where we started talking and started talking more and then started becoming friends and all of these sort of things, which ultimately led to that video that I released. And it's really just this idea that you can make incredible friends on Twitter. Like 
Another one I've made is Justin McElroy, who was the former speechwriter for General Petraeus and General Mattis here in the U.S. And for me as a public speaking guy, and also I do some speech writing here locally in Dallas, is super cool to meet somebody who is writing speeches on that level. And I would have never had that opportunity if I wasn't on Twitter, wasn't making these connections, wasn't building them. Right. And it was one of, like, I remember the first time I talked to Justin and I was just full geek mode, full nerding out about speech writing. And like, I didn't care anything about General Petraeus or General Mattis. I was <laughs> just like, Justin, tell me how you went about writing this speech. Like, tell me your process. I want to know all about you and what you did. Because right. to me, that was the cool stuff. Right. That kind of opportunity is just because of Twitter, because you put out value, you're talking about ideas, right. responding to people, you're building a network, and it is just absolutely mind-blowing what is possible. But it's tough because it's going to feel like you're banging your head against the wall in month one and in month two and in month three. And then there's going to be a breakthrough because you stay consistent. You're tweeting every day, you're staying on message, and you're adding value. That's where the, the real growth comes in. Got it. So is, is there any difference between building relationships and connections in real world vis-a-vis uh, -vis on uh, platforms like Twitter or the human aspect remains the same, I would imagine, isn't it? Yeah, the human aspect really remains the same. I think, I mean, it's obviously different because sometimes in person you get the immediate vibes that like, hey, we connect on that kind of like personal level. Got it. Where, on Twitter, right, it's just like words, and it's hard to get somebody's vibe through okay. words. So that can be a little bit more challenging to, to achieve. But that's why I say, for me, the goal is always people I want to connect with is provide value and then move to the DMs as quickly as possible, and then hopefully move to some sort of call so we can actually engage more in with this human interaction okay. where we're seeing each other instead of just black and white text on a little Twitter screen while I look at you know my, my phone. Got it. So and we, we talked about uh, what works best. Maybe you also have some examples where people actually screw up and uh, do not, uh, uh, in, instead of building relationship, they're actually ruining it. What are the ways you can, you can spoil it all and ruin it all instead of building it? Do you, have you, have you found people who have irked you a bit maybe? Uh, a sales C or something of that sort? I think the biggest, so you've got probably two issues. One, somebody just jumps in and thinks that you should be able to build a relationship just by saying, I want to build a relationship. Mm. And that simply isn't the case. Like you need to demonstrate that your time and their time, like it's valuable. And so you have to build a relationship. You can't just, you can't just DM somebody and be like, Hey, I want to get on a call with you. Okay. Like, why, why? I don't know anything about you. I don't know why I would want to do this. Like, I have finite time, and a lot of people make that mistake. The, the other mistake people make is thinking of Twitter as a transactional world where, hey, I just want to meet you because you can do something for me and I can do something for you. That's so wrong. Every relationship I've built on Twitter has nothing to do with I thought they could do anything for me. It was simply... I liked what they were doing. I was interested in them as a, as a person and have built real connections because of that. Okay. Now, some of those people have ended up helping me and I've helped them, but it was yep. not because we ever went in with the intention of, hey, you can do this for me and I can do this for you. People who approach it that way, it feels very transactional, which mm. actually prevents you from creating a real connection with that person. Okay. And that's what your focus should be is real connections, real friendships, building a network because that is much more long lasting and much more impactful. It's also just more enjoyable. Like, man, if we just look at the world as transactional, that's awful. It's so much nicer to look at it on a human level and connections and just building cool stuff with cool people. Got it. Yeah. I, I've seen cool people don't keep scores. Okay. They, they just make an impact on one and then move to the other person. Uh, never, never having, never ever keeping any score. Uh, great, thank you, thank you for for sharing that. Um, there is another Twitter post that I picked up yesterday, and I want you to explain this. And you said uh, too many people give up too soon. I started thinking about performative speaking in my second year of law school. That was in 2012. Eight years of building, planning, and preparing. Just keep going. It takes time and an unwavering belief in your vision. Um, 
just tell us a bit about persistence and long term thinking on um, to 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 achieve anything of greatness yeah so i tweeted that because i think people see some of the success i've had recently with performance speaking and think that this just appeared magically like i just got lucky it was easy i built out quickly and there's kind of two parts to that is like i said there's this eight year journey and there's also i saw a moment and i reacted very quickly so that i could build it very quickly but it was because i've been spending the last eight years planning right. preparing and building for right. that moment for when i saw it i could immediately react got it it's it's kind of like the the track olympian right like they prepare all their life for one moment to sprint 10 seconds to see if they're the world's fastest man right. and that's essentially what you're doing is you're trying to set yourself up over those 8 years to right. be ready for when that that starting gun goes off and right. you can say now it's go time the it's easy to quit because it feels like you may be going nowhere right but if you have a long term vision this is where i think there's a different difference between vision and dreams mm -hmm. dreams are something we just have this hope and wish will happen right vision is something that we have taken our dream and said there are steps that i can take to achieve this right and then you basically plan out those steps to take and i took those i had this vision of creating something outside of the law right and said i need to try 100 jury trials before i'm able to do that right. i need to have experience teaching at SMU. I need to build these things. And yes, that means my pay is going to be a lot less for those first five, six years of my career because I'm playing a longer game. And you have to be willing to accept that while you watch everybody else who maybe is having more immediate success. Sure. It's not going to be something that lends itself to compound growth over time. And sure. I'm focused on this long-term vision of what I want to achieve and that meant i had to be prepared to say man this sucks some days i'm not getting where i want to as fast as i want to get there right but that was really the key was having this unwavering belief in myself and in my vision to continue to press on and continue to move forward until i saw that moment that i could seize and that's when i really went into into full on 100% action with zero looking behind me got it i want to ask you i want to just double top tap on this topic especially people who are not sure of their strengths and they would just pick uh, a field or a niche and then um, they are not very sure if they have the natural abilities or not i'm sure you were aware of your strengths you might not be as good 8 years ago of course you had to work hard uh, but at what what due diligence one should do before committing say uh, eight nine years ten years of their life into something uh, before they are burnt out or not seeing any ray of hope at the end of that tunnel so what 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 are some of the things are check boxes they should tick before committing to something for that long so i think one easy way is to ask other people what your strengths are and what they think of you so whether that's friends family mentors colleagues because they'll tell you a lot of the strengths that you have and i remember to this day my mother when i was about to go into law school said robby i had jury jury service the other day I said you need to be one of those lawyers you you'd be good at that like you like to talk you like to argue you'd be good at at going into court and doing that stuff and at that time cuz i was about to go into law school i was saying no 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 I, that's that's not what I want, because I knew at that point those those attorneys didn't make a lot of money, right. and so when I first went in, I'm thinking you know like every first year law student, I want to just make the huge huge dollar stuff. But she was right, and in that first year of law school, I quickly realized when I got involved in the trial world that I loved it. It was absolutely made for me. Right. And so it was all be like I pushed back, but my mom and dad both said the same thing. Friends said the same thing, and I think if you go to those people who know you, and also people you work with—bosses, mentors, colleagues, whatever it may be—they'll tell you your strengths, and then you've just got to figure out what about my strengths makes me unique. And that kind of goes back to another person that I look up to, and that's David Perel, who came up with this idea of personal monopoly that he talks about in *Rite of Passage*. 
And it's really figuring out what are kind of like these three areas that you have that overlap and create your personal monopoly. And for me, the two big ones that overlap are trial lawyer, which involves this public speaking stuff and pop culture. I really use those two together, which makes me more unique because that's not a normal approach. But then I also have this history focus and specific areas of history. That is my third kind of circle. And when you bring all those together, it creates what I call performative speaking. And nobody else really has that personal monopoly that I have. That's what makes me unique. I think once you start figuring out those skills, figuring out what you're passionate about, you can start figuring those personal monopolies out and then making sure that there's a way for you to be successful long-term using that personal monopoly, that there's an industry in it, right? Like I was a college baseball player. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I could have tried for eight years to be a professional baseball player and I still would not have been a professional baseball player. So yes, you have to be realistic in what you can do. And that's an easy way is getting outside input. And then also, if you have an idea, testing it, build in public, throw it out there, see if people are interested in you doing that thing you're talking about. Right. And um, so one thing I passionately feel about, and when I see people just uh, frittering away their natural skills and abilities, uh, there are very few people who commit to be excel in something they are good at. They mostly uh, sleepwalk through their lives, not realizing what their skills are and not becoming good at anything. So mostly they have a mediocre life. And one thing I always, whenever I catch people young, especially in 20s, because I wasted my 20s, I only got to know my strengths or got serious about uh, applying my strengths was in in, uh, (laughs) mid-30s. but this is a sad story, isn't it? Uh, wh- what would be your advice to uh, to people uh, to, to, to become good at something? And when did you think that I better be good at this one thing? Because you are naturally good, but what would your advice be to, to people, uh, youngsters who are listening to this? Yeah, I think you find, find your strengths find what you do really well. And some of that goes back to the previous answer where you've got to be asking people, getting some feedback because maybe you don't realize it. And then just going all in on it. So for me, I remember I was a good speaker in law school. I had good success. I went into my first job. I was doing all right. And I lost a case that I shouldn't have lost. And I was very frustrated. And I actually heard the jury talking to to the defendant afterwards. And they told him, you know that you were guilty. We know that you were guilty, but we gave you a break this time because we know that you're not going to do it again. So what I heard them say is I had one. They just decided that they liked the other guy more than they liked me, Mm -hmm. that I was not compelling enough in the way that I spoke to them in the way I presented my messaging, because I just used that logic and reason that we talked about earlier. And that was the moment that was, I think, trial number 12 in my career that I said, I am going to just absolutely master this craft. I'm going to watch everybody who speaks. I'm going to take from them. I'm going to learn. I'm going to study it. I'm going to practice it. I'm going to do everything that I can to become what I I call an exceptional speaker. I want to be in the top 1% of 1% of speakers. Right. That is my goal. And that was my goal from that moment on was to put in the time and the effort and the energy to achieve that goal. And that was really just because I got hit in the face, essentially saying I lost and I shouldn't have lost. And that frustrated me. So I said, you know what? I'm going all in. And that's what I think people need to be willing to do is go all in on the strengths you have. I don't like being a master of all. I'd rather be exceptional at something so I can stand out and really make a difference in that in that industry, that role, whatever it may be. And for me, that really comes down to public speaking, helping other people. Like, I mean, obviously I can do, when the world opens back up, I'll be giving speeches and talks and things of that nature because I love that kind of world. But I wanna help other people go from good to great, go from great to exceptional. Right. Because that'll also elevate me. That'll make me better at the same time. So it's both selfless and selfish because I can help others, but it will also make me better. Right. And the world needs exceptional people. And each of us can can hone that ex- exceptional skills within within ourselves. And I always tell people that if you are not going all in, as you said, with your 
natural abilities, then you are betraying the purpose of your life. Of course, there is rewards because when you are becoming exceptional, you attract a lot of rewards uh, uh, for the for the hard work that you have put in. But other than the rewards, it's also your moral obligation that you should not be just frittering away your skills. Instead, go all in, as you said. Um, uh, thank you. you. You mentioned about personal mono monopoly, and I have not been uh, familiar with David Perl yet. I know I have to um, get to him and read about him. But what does? Could you shed some more light on what what uh, creates personal monopoly? So, in a lot of ways, it kind of looks like you know you have three circles that are your areas of expertise or things that you're really good at or things you're passionate about. Got it. And where those overlap is something that only you can do because you basically are stacking these things. Nobody else has my trial experience, plus my love of pop culture and knowledge of movies and television, and anime and those sort of things, and my love of history and knowledge of nationalism and the 1970s and 1980s in US politics and the rise of the re religious right. Okay. Nobody else has this overlap of three different areas. And what that creates is something that is unique to me. Nobody else can do it like I can do it because I have this unique perspective. And that's your personal monopoly. That's what makes you special. That's what will attract other people to you when you really hone in on this idea of this is my personal monopoly. This is what I'm going to talk about. And other people will start gravitating towards those ideas. Got it. Got it. So you could be in the top 10% of one skill, top 10% of the second skill and the third skill. But if you combine all of them together, then you can, you can be at the top 0.1%, isn't it? So that makes you even more unique. Yep. Excellent. Um, great. So I think I, that's all I had. But uh, before that, I mean, I, I usually ask this question as a as a reflection. If you were to live your life all over again, how do you live it differently? I love the pause. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I I said earlier, I I believe in thoughtful answers and vulnerability and confidence to sit in that silence and really think about and reflect because it's a great question. And I've been very happy with my life. Like to, to be completely honest, it's gone nicely. I don't have any great complaints. I think the biggest thing I would do if I were to go back is just start creating earlier. And I don't mean just creating writing and videos and things of that nature. But obviously I would, because I think there's an incredible power in creating content and material for other people to live out in the world. But I also mean creating experiences. I would have traveled more earlier. I would have taken, I would have spent less time probably in the baseball world and more time creating experiences by traveling, doing other things that maybe were more risky. So when I was playing, I was very risk averse because I didn't want to get hurt and miss baseball. Mm. Looking back on that, I wish I would have done more of that when I was younger to build some of these other experiences. Now, I have since I do a lot of that in this day and age in the last few years, but I would have liked to be creating experiences, creating content, and just really feel myself as a creator earlier than I do now, I mean, I now I definitely identify as a creator, but I wish I would have started that process when I was 18. Thank you. Well, this brings us to an end of a deeply insightful conversation, Robbie uh, Crabtree. Robbie, thank you for all uh, sharing all that wisdom that you've acquired. And I, as I said, your energy and your uh, authenticity comes through. And I got very excited and uh, some of that energy uh, uh, rubbed on to me. A very, very thoughtful answers, very deep answers. It just shows how genuine a person you are and all the best for your future with, and keep inspiring us all. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye.